Game of Thrones, Episode 9, Baylor. This is the big one of Season 1. Uh, it's the penultimate episode. And in Game of Thrones, the penultimate is almost like the finale. And Episode 10 is almost like an epilogue for the events that transpired in that epic episode. You know, it settles the dust. The dust settles on what we saw last episode. The real, either the shocking moment or the big battle. And it kind of sets forward the next season. Yeah, it's uh, it's different from other shows. I can't really think of a show off the top of my head who kind of does it like that. But yeah, let's get right into this episode. Uh, it begins with Ned in the dungeons. Again, he's talking to Varys. And I love how in this scene, Varys almost gives him the same advice that Littlefinger gave him to try and make peace with Cersei. Because he says that right now the Lannisters are more scared of Stannis than they are of your son. And Ned is also shocked to learn that Rob, a boy of 16, is leading men into war. Um, but you get a little insight into how the Lannisters are thinking that. They're thinking about Stannis. They're not thinking about Rob. Why are they sleeping on Rob, man? Well, it kind of helps his cause because we see him throughout the seasons. He's, he wins every battle. Well, yeah, he's constantly being looked over because of his age. But I don't know. I, I like to think, like, what's Varys' plan here? Like, is he actually trying to just be a friend? Or is it much deeper than that? And I think he's actually, maybe he does like Ned, but he kind of wants to delay chaos. You know, when he's speaking to Illyrio earlier in the season, he's saying things are starting to move quickly. You know, we're running out of time and they need time for their plan to flesh out. So I, I think it's a little bit of both. He respects Ned, but at the same time, he's trying to help his own. He's trying to help himself as well and his plans. And he also also tells him about Sansa, how Sansa came to court and was begging on her knees for Joffrey to show Ned mercy. And this kind of gets Ned thinking that, okay, I might not value my own life as much because I was raised to be a soldier. I was essentially raised to die fighting for my house. Maybe I'll trade in my honor for the life of my children. Which if is, I can save Sansa and Arya, then I will declare Joffrey the true king. Which ironically is honorable. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah, in a way. And there's a scene later in this episode where Maester Eamon and John are kind of discussing, you know, would your father trade his honor to save the ones he loved? You know, love is the death of duty, essentially. But it becomes a little bit great here. What's duty? What's honor? What's the right thing to do? And a little thing kind of teases later, I think season four, when he asks Varys if he can free him. He says, I can, but I'm not going to. It's kind of like when he frees Jamie, even though that's... Yeah, Varys could have got him out of there. I mean, Jamie makes Varys free Tyrion. That's what I meant when he frees right, Tyrion. Yeah. But, you know, he knows the way. And we also get an introduction in this episode to Walder Frey. Not in this scene, but it's Rob and his host arriving at the Twins. And he's kind of getting the rundown of what type of man Walder Frey is. That, you know, he's a bannerman to House Tully, but he showed up late to the Trident. They call him the late Walder Frey. He essentially learns that this guy's a cunt. And <laughs> you can't trust him. Oh, wow, that's strong. Uh, yeah, he definitely is. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot you're a Frey guy. I'm not a Frey guy. You're don't, a big Frey guy. Don't put that out there, I swear to God. Yeah, and when Cat goes to speak to him, too, you just see, like, you hear all this beforehand, and you just get to see how petty he is. He takes everything as a slight. Like, he's going down the list of uh, of Hoster Tully all the times he insulted him. Like, he has a list, <laughs> and he's ready to whip at it any times. Like, oh, yep, uh, two, 288 AC. Uh, Walder didn't email me back, so I got that on there. <laughs> That's every fucking thing that's ever, every time he's been wronged, ready to ready to spew out. Yeah, and the Green Fork is so important to the Stark army because they need to cross the Green Fork to lift the Siege of Riverrun that's being led by Jaime. So basically in the books, I think they say the river is flooded, so they can't cross it that far north. They need the twins in order to cross it to get to Riverrun in time. Uh, they could travel south and cross it, but you're just wasting time at that point. So Catelyn returns to their camp and says that in order for them to cross the twins, there has to be some sort of payment that they're going to have to give him. And he wants Rob to marry one of his daughters, and he wants Arya to marry one of his sons. I love the line that Rob says where he's like, did you get a good look at any of them? <laughs> and I love how Theon starts laughing. Yeah, Cat needs to uh, get better at her negotiating skills. She got fleeced on that deal. Yeah, that was not a great deal. I'll tell you what, Catelyn Tully is the worst <laughs> deal maker in the Riverlands. Listen, I mean, we always debate about what lost Rob the war. Like you said, she gets fleeced in this deal, and she basically, she's a New York Knicks. Walter Frey was, uh, what's any his other, face? Any other team in the NBA. What's the GM for Toronto that always bops the Knicks? OC? Uh, there's got to be a Raptor fan in the comments. Comment below. You guys aren't winning this year. Yeah, but back at the wall, this is a great scene, too, because... It's Gior Mormont awarding, rewarding John for his valor. And I love this relationship, too, because it's it's that father-son relationship that he probably had with his father as well. And Gior and John are such, I mean, Gior and Ned are such similar characters. It's the first time, like, we've been introduced to Valyrian, uh, Littlefinger's Valyrian dagger earlier in the season. Uh, I'm not sure if they mentioned that 
ice as Valyrian in this season, but I think it's the first time they actually con- they convey the significance of Valyrian steel to the audience just by John's sheer reaction of him being like, it's a Valyrian steel, like, I can't take this. It's the first time we really get the sense of how valuable this is and how valuable it will play later on in the series. Yeah, that sword is huge. And you could see the respect that Gior has for how Stark he replaces the bear pummel with the wolf, the white wolf. And it's really the potential that he sees in John, you know, taking him on as, in, as his steward, grooming him for command. It's that potential leadership role that he sees in John's future. Well, and he also learns the news about Rob. And I said this last time, I wish I wish John just would have bailed. Oh, yeah, he does learn the news about Rob, right? Yeah, yeah he learns it from letter. Sam. Yeah, I wish... We got some Rob and John leading the Stark men down to the King's Landing. Well, I love how the first thing that John does with his priceless sword is leave it with a bunch of murderers, rapists, and criminals. <laughs> yeah, and like you said, with John learning about Rob when he talks to Maester Raymond, and we learn the truth about Maester Raymond and the history of his family. And when he tells the story about where he was a fragile, old, blind man, and he gets the news that his entire house has been destroyed, his family is wiped out, he's essentially the last Targaryen alive, how traumatizing getting that news is. And and he was such a he was in such a helpless position as well and it kind of for john it puts it in, into perspective you know i'm not the only one who's experienced this before well yeah he's been through this essentially the same thing where your duty gets and your honor gets called into question and you and you got to fight with that struggle it's a little thing because they changed from the books right because aegon the fifth son was jaharis not yeah. Ares, and jaharis got it because duncan the small pulled the edward the eighth with jenny volstones right so that's all cut out thanks D&D. Well, I mean, it's... Who cares? <laughs> I know. It's just... It makes the story, because not, when I first heard that, and he was like, and then his son was the Mad King, I was like, oh shit. I well, was yeah, like, damn, he's connected. It doesn't remove him from what the known that we have. It kind of it kind of closes the gap between him and Daenerys and Jon in, in that sense. Yeah, because I always freak myself out trying to figure out how they're related. Great, great grandpa, great, great, great uncle. Well, on the show, it would be great, great uncle. Man, he's old. Great, great. Great, great. Well, he has a great line, too, when he says love is the death of duty. And this is when they're talking about, you know, would your father trade his honor for the ones he loves? And John says, if it was the right thing to do. Do you feel like he's kind of encouraging John here? I don't think he's encouraged. I, I would lean towards more. He's saying, listen, bitch, deal with it. OK, I don't think he's leaning that hard towards either side of of the argument. I think there's some regret in what he did. And I also think that if he was oh, ab- 100%, if he was an able bodied man, he would have. If he wasn't blind, if he wasn't, if age didn't get the better of him and he was in his prime, I think he's kind of conveying that, yeah, I probably would have left. Well, maybe this moment too, going forward, it makes Maester Eamon think this kid is stronger than I ever was. Because like you said, John was an able bodied man, blessed with youth, the gift of being a great swordsman. He could have very well left the Night's Watch. Rob would have pardoned him. He wouldn't have killed John if he joined his host. So maybe this is what really gets Eamon on his side going forward. Because we see Maester Eamon in the later seasons. He's always taking John's side. He's one of his strongest allies. So this moment could be the one that he looks back on and thinks, yeah, that Jon Snow, he's a, he's a good kid. And back in Essos, we see Cal Drogo. Not doing so hot. It's had better days. Cal who can't ride is no true Cal, man. That's, that's the facts of life. This is the one, one of the deaths that I predicted when I first watched the show. I was like, this guy's not sticking around. There were two guys that I knew weren't sticking around. Robert, King Robert. I was like, he's going to be the one that drives the wedge of the show, the Starks and the Lannisters. And Drogo, because they were obviously positioning Daenerys to be one of the main characters. And I love how she kind of maneuvers between saving Cal's life in this in this scene she's like set up camp they're like oh this is no place to camp she's like just fucking set up fucking camp okay we can have bernism <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny it's Jorah on the strings yeah <laughs> doing a uh, drogo voice <laughs> that job of the hut and it's so crazy that we always talk about how westerosi society is a man's world but the dothraki culture specifically is built on this hyper masculinity where if you're the king of a kalasar and you can't ride on your horse where you physically cannot ride a horse you can't be king anymore like we're gonna kill you we're gonna kill you we're gonna kill your wife and then we're gonna fight for who's gonna be the next king it's insane but that's just <laughs> how the dothraki are gal drogo man has never lost a fucking battle and then he gets sick and it's like get out of here you're done and we cut to uh, Tywin meeting with his war council, and uh, he gives Tyrion his favorite son, the Vanguard. <laughs> and it's so funny because we were arguing about like how the Great John in the last episode was insulted that he didn't get the Vanguard, and Tyrion gets it. He's like, "Oh, you could have found a better way to kill me." <laughs> well, that's very much the difference between the North and the South, right? It's like the North is the Vanguard is considered an honorable position within the army, and in the South, it's like you suck. You're gonna 
get the van card because I want you dead. And it shows that Tywin Lannister, at this point, you know, you could tell that there's a tension between them, but it's just so stupid to ostracize Tyrion from the family. This is your most valuable ally. If Tyrion was Jaime, if Tyrion was six foot three, a great swordsman, he'd be the goddamn king of the world. You know, this would be the guy that Tywin would be grooming to be his successor. It shows more of their relationship. We got like a little hints in episodes prior, but we don't really know the full extent until a scene later on in the episode, but this kind of leads up to it. And speaking of which, then Tyrion meets Shay for the first time. Shay, yeah. This is the it's actually the scene when they played for his when he won his Emmy. Like the little clip they played before, like Peter Dinklage, Game of Thrones. Well, Shay is a character. I know you're not a big Shay fan. I, I do like Shay. I like that they made her more intelligent, that she's more basically independent, that she has a mind of her own. Obviously, she's still a whore in the show. She's only interested in Tyrion because of what he can do for her. I think they combined the Taisha character with Shay. Because in the book, it's very much when Tyrion kills Shay, he's only thinking about Taisha. You know, that's all he says when he goes to Essos. What is Ty- Where do the whores go? You know, he keeps saying that to himself. Great question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Tywin with those one-liners, man. Tyrion, if you ever find out, let, let, let a brother know. Let a, you know, <laughs> hook a brother up, man. <laughs> I know a lot of people don't like her, but, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll talk more about that as the seasons You ever see on. her prior work to Game of Thrones? No. Good stuff. Yeah. I'll send you a link. Shay is also a character that they changed from the books. In the book, she's only 18 years old. In the show, she's much older. In the book, she's actually a girl from Westeros. In the show, obviously, her accent, she says that she's from Essos. Um, that's because of the actress who plays her is actually from Germany, uh, Seibel Kakeli. And yeah, overall, I just I, I appreciate this character more because it's hard to film Tyrion just dragging around a concubine with him for three seasons. That's essentially what it would have been if they stayed faithful to the books. So it's a change, even though I'm in the minority, it's a change that I appreciate. In this next scene, we have Cal Drogo and he's lying down and basically Daenerys calls in the witch. What's her name? I can never remember her name. Miri Mazder, looking like Artemis from Always Sunny. Yeah, well, his wound is looking fucking disgusting when Jorah takes a peep under the covers there. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's Dan, not... You wash, get a fucking washcloth, man. I like how Danny, she, like, she refuses to face reality when all this is going on. Like, her only hope is for Cal to live and... Or she's nothing again, and it scares her. You know, she's afraid of what will happen if Cal's actually dead, and she's kind of struggling with trying every every last effort to have him get through it. Yeah, well, Daenerys has a god complex herself, and she th- she thinks she's going to live forever, and at this point, I think she thinks the same thing of Khal Drogo. Like, she finally got in the groove of being a Khaleesi, um, and at this point, I really do think she loves him. She's in love with him, whether it's Stockholm Syndrome or something else. This is pretty fucked up, too, this whole scene. When the tent, when you hear the screams, it's kind of messed up, man. The blood magic, when she slits the, the horse's throat. Yeah, I don't... I don't like it. I don't, I'm, I'm with the Dothraki. You would be safe. <laughs> uh, and then we have Jorah fighting. One yeah, it's putting that work in. Yeah. Well, the armor. This is a callback to when he had the conversation earlier with one of the Dothraki. What's earlier that? in the season when he says armor always is going to beat no armor. It's like the... Sh- what's that show? Like, I think it was like on Spike TV where they take like two warriors and like who would win. It was like a knight versus a Bachelor? samurai. No, not the Bachelor. I don't know. Some stupid show. It's kind of like, oh, it answers the age-old question, who would win? Uh, Dothraki or uh, a knight or a samurai. Knight. Well, it was like twelve. Show them. Yeah, it was alright. Probably got canceled. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, can like no one else deliver a baby? Like I know, I know the uh, what, what they call them, the Dothraki handmaids or whatever. Yeah, they said they didn't want to deal with it. I mean, someone there probably could have delivered a baby. Yeah, Jorah could have delivered the baby. I mean, I mean, just sanitize your hands. That's the only place, option right? really to go in a haunted tent. Push. Right? That's all you do, right? Push. I think so. I think you're... I'm onto it, right? I can yeah. deliver a baby. I deliver on this show every week. Let's go look to our Patreon if you uh, pl- a new reward. Have Bo deliver your yeah. baby. <laughs> I can't do twins. Can't do two babies. Only one baby at a time. Um, And this next scene, Tyrion and Shay. Well, they don't come out together. They come out one at a time, I assume. Well, I don't know how babies... I don't, I don't know. And in this scene, we see Tyrion and Shay and Bronn and having this little bonding session before... Well, we forgot to mention before that Rob's army is marching on uh, the Lannister camp. <laughs> the battle is tomorrow. Uh, so they're enjoying their time, they're drinking wine, and here we see the, the deduction powers of Tyrion Lannister. I like to call him Tyrion Holmes. I think Sherlock would have cracked Shay like an egg. Like she's just denying her but, past. Can we talk about Westerosi drinking games? Okay. Trash. That's all I gotta say. Stupid. I couldn't think of anything better than like a candle game and like some stupid game Tyrion made up. Doesn't make sense because how are you gonna tell if I'm lying? And how much wine is in that picture and anyway? And we also learned about, uh, we also learned about Taisha. 
and what Tywin did to her. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the woman that Tyrion married. Wow, this is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Yeah, it sets up Tywin as being like we get a little hints, like I said before, but this is really like Bronn says, "I would have killed the man." That, this that's is beyond amazing. fucked up. This is like demented. Yeah, it's, like just kill the kid then. You know, just get rid of him. Well, it's not send him to the Night's Watch, like uh, Tarly did. When he heard that news, he was like, "Fuck, I could have done that." Oh, wow, shit. <laughs> Uh, just made him hand to the king. <laughs> I wish they kept the Taisha arc with Jamie and all that, the things that happened later on. The story is made up pretty much. Taisha actually did love uh, Tyrion, and she wasn't a whore. It was just that, <laughs> <So> <laughs> which what makes re- it even more fucked up. Yeah. But see, I feel like it wasn't supposed to be that, but like when George wrote the scene of Tyrion's escape, he was like, I'm just going to make it that it was real. Another thing to just add on. Well, I kind of like it because it drives a, a, the rift between Jamie and Tyrion. Is I mean, they have a little thing. Like, Jamie, Jamie still doesn't like Tyrion because he killed his father. But, but that's the thing. Like, there's it's Tyrion so... hatred towards Jamie, which I think which makes the later books a lot better, that relationship and that d- divide between them. Yeah, but there's already so much drama in the show. There's only so many fucking rifts and backstabbings and twists. It's well, like, I liked it. Oh, look at this. And Young Griff. Even though I, I, I'm a big Young Griff guy now. Um, you hopped on the bandwagon? Yeah. Uh, and then the next morning when he wakes up with Shay and he can hear the alarms going off and he's going into battle and he's like, if I fall, weep for me. And Shay's like, you'll be dead. How will you know? And another thing uh, about the whole Taisha thing, I think it makes Tyrion's motivation of killing Tywin a lot more, be- uh, a lot better. All right, we're we're well. It just popped into my brain. We'd be doing season two, episode six. Yeah, well, you know, going back to the Taisha thing. Oh, I'm, every episode I'm going to drop a Taisha right, reference. Well. Yeah. Uh, and then Tyrion and Bronn going into battle, and uh, <laughs> this guy Bronn's like, stay low. It's like if you're lucky, <laughs> they won't see you. So, Tyrion's like, oh, well, Bronn hit the Lannister army with a mellow jab step. Oh, yeah, well, okay, that's disrespectful. It's not a mellow jab step. It was LeBron going between the legs and, and Thompson's legs. Oh, prime mellow jab step? Mm, you don't know what's going on. I'm pretty sure I know what's going on. He's jabbing to the right, then pulling back and hitting a mid-range <laughs> jumper or missing it. <laughs> that's usually all he did. Nick fans here. Yeah. Talk about torture. <laughs> No one rallies the troops like uh, Tyrion Lannister. Oh, he does give a great speech. And I love the way that they got around the budget constraints for this season. They just knocked him out. Because you do see this in the books. And Tyrion actually kills some people during this battle in the book. You read the book? I did. Yeah, I'm a big book guy. See fire and blood coming out? No winds in winter. Mm. It's a fucking disgrace. But that was a very clever way to get around it. Just have Tyrion knocked out. And he wakes up and he's like, did we win? Bronn's like, we wouldn't be talking if we didn't. And uh, Tywin delivers the news that, yeah, they had 2,000 men. Rob Stark wasn't here. He was with his other 18,000 men. And uh, it cuts to the Whispering Wood. And I love seeing this from Catelyn's perspective. Because that's how you do see it from the book. Rob riding in on the horse looking like a bag of gushers. Oh, yeah. He was looking like a king in that (laughs) scene. He's like, yeah, I won. (laughs) I got him. Uh, And then this really is the beginning of Jaime's redemption arc. When he gets captured by the Stark army. Yeah, and Jaime... uh... Goes up to Rob, which I don't think Jamie has the power to make these terms. 1v1. <laughs> I'll fight for the Lannisters, you fight for the Starks. Winner take all. Uh, and Rob smartly declines because he would get absolutely smoked. Yeah, he knows his reputation. Jamie would tap dance on him. Hit him with this to the left now, y'all. <laughs> One hop this time. He'll hit Dad. him with the, the, the LeBron crab dribble. Yeah, the crab dribble? Yeah. Oh my god, was this 2009? <laughs> I love the speech that Rob gives, too. He's like, you know, we won today, but that doesn't make us conquerors. Well, he's struggling with the fact also that he's just sent 2,000 men to their death. Right, and Theon's like, oh, they'll sing songs for them. He's like, well, the dead don't hear songs. It's like what Shay said. Um, It foreshadows that this kid is going to be a a great leader. He's one of those, he's great at rallying the troops. He's a great wartime leader. He might not be a great politician, but he knows how to lead. Has a Stark ever been a great politician? Sansa. (laughs) Yeah. Well, she learned from the best. And this ties in, too, with Ned's trial, too. I wonder what would have happened if they would have got the news in King's Landing of Jamie's capture before this all happened. Oh, war is over. War, yeah. yeah, war is over at that point because Tywin Lannister is like, that's my heir. Because Tywin, he loves Jamie, and his whole fucking goal is to mold Jamie into the guy who's going to further the Lannister legacy. Trade right away. Ned's not taking the black. That's a good swap. First you need, well, Ned was ready to admit that Joffrey was the true king anyway. So at that point, the Starks have the leverage there. They can just say, you know, Ned won't take the black, we'll give you Jaime, and everybody goes home. Well, even if he's still in the dungeon and they find out they have Jaime, that's just an even trade. Yeah, yeah, at that point. Right, they probably cancel the whole Ned, trial. Arya, Sansa, go home. Yeah, well, seeing this from Arya's perspective, too, where she's just scurrying around the streets, trying to catch pigeons, begging for food. Uh, then she hears, you know, they're taking the hand of the king to the sept of Baylor. Yeah, when he says Baylor, <laughs> shit gets me every time. Yeah, I'm like, oh boy. And Yorin looks over and to see Arya, I'm like, Baylor! 
it's funny when Joffrey gives the speech. He's like, you know, so long as I'm your king, treason will always be we'll dealt never with. go unpunished. Right. Yeah, that's what he says. Did you watch the episode? Stuff. No, I didn't. Okay. I haven't watched a, a second of this show at all. Just <laughs> I do Wikipedia. Uh, and every single time this moment happens, well, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, somebody's going to pop out of nowhere and save him. And then they cut to Ari and she's got her hand on her hilt. Oh, my God. Yeah, I thought something was going to happen. But now it's like watching it in retrospect. It's just she's so helpless. Yeah. There's nothing she can do. And it's it's it gets harder to watch every time you see it because you know what's coming. I know. I, yeah, I held out to the last second there. And I love Ned's reaction. He looks over at Joffrey. He's like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Well, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cersei. Yeah. Well, Cersei's I know like Joffrey. What the hell? Are Such you a doing? terrible decision. Yeah. No, it's a very dumb thing to do. And Varys doesn't like it. Littlefinger. Like they're all questioning is what he's doing. But you know, Littlefinger's kind of like, eh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. I could play off of this. Yeah, I got like four other plans depending on how this goes. So. Yeah, do what you want, kid. And I think it says a lot about the respect that Northerners have for the Stark family, where Yorin, he was obviously told by Ned, you know, Arya's at the statue of Baylor, but he takes it upon himself to shield Arya from what she's about to see. And it's that respect that the Northerners have for the Stark family. Yorin doesn't know if Ned is actually a traitor or not. He doesn't know if he committed treason. For all he knows, Ned is a traitor. But it's that faith that he has in Ned Stark, Ned Stark the man, where he takes it upon himself in the next season where he's protective over Arya. He wants to get her back home and he's risking his own life. You know, the men men of the Night's Watch are not supposed to get involved with the politics, but it shows a lot about the character of Yorin and what he's willing to do for Ned Stark and his family. But this is where I think Game of Thrones became genius. This is what makes it timeless because it's that the first season arc of the honorable man does everything right and gets his head chopped off. And it's, it's just, in all of its subversion of cliche excellence, this is what makes Game of Thrones timeless. This moment. Because I remember the first time I saw it, I wasn't even shocked. I was, it was like disbelief. I was, I was, I was like, up. I, I can't even describe how I felt. I was like confused more than I was shocked. I felt that way at the Red Wedding when I read it, but... <laughs> watching watching this was the first introduction of what kind of show it is because it's and so swift they obviously build it up with the you know it's slow motion the way he swings the sword Ellen Payne swinging ice but it's kind of like chop and the birds <laughs> and fly and he's dead yeah the birds fly and he's and he's dead I th- <laughs> it sucks <laughs> It's like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Like, what other show, like, takes there? Because it is Ned's story in the first season. I mean, you have your other supporting characters, but the main focus is on Ned and the Starks. It's a risky move, especially not knowing how your supporting characters are going to be received and if they're going to be able to be able to lead the show moving forward or the book. I mean, in the book, it's easier because you tell so many different perspectives and you have and you develop the characters within the chapters more than a show can ever do. It's hard to see if that can translate into a television show, but it has. What can you say about Ned Stark? It's the end of the road for one of the most beloved Game of Thrones characters. He dies in season one. Even in season seven, his impact can still be felt through the characters, through the memes, how he's lived on throughout the show's run. And Ned Stark, I'm always drawn to these characters that are honorable and good, that stay true to themselves, even in the face of impossible odds or impossible evil. And you can see the effect that he's had on his children with Rob and John and even Sansa and Arya. They always bring him up and they're character, the way that they've grown into their roles, you can see the effect that Ned has had on their lives. And Ned Stark is still one of my favorite characters that the show has ever produced. The world today needs more Ned Starks. The world would be a much better place if we had more Ned Starks. Great character, great man, great performance by Sean Bean carrying this first season. And it was a very, it's just a very sad moment to see this character go. Just so unexpected, but that's the genius of the show. So what would you give this episode out of 10? Uh, 10. Yeah, I give it a 10 out of 10. First one of the, uh, the first season. First of many. Oh, next episode's going to be tough to review. Rob, your sword. <laughs> Rob. Oh, my God. Hey, guys. Thank you for watching this video. And before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel. So thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup. And you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks. 